sign on the doors, right? The students came in to the lecture. <clears throat> of course, paper sign can't play the music. <laughs> so I would just put it on and insert appropriate music. Which, uh, which one of the was that? that was Mars. Okay. So, <clears throat> how do you start modern physics? <laughs> um, what I need to do is I need to completely upend your understanding of how the physical universe works. All one and at one and three quarters of the semester. So all of your physics up to this point. We're not going to flush it all down the toilet, but we are going to radically change how you think about very very basic things, and so. I was very serious about that last time. You need to let go. You just need to let go because there's going to be moments today and next week where you are going to be sitting there going, this is the biggest pile of crap I have ever heard in my entire life. The universe can't possibly be this way. The physicists are all making it up. Mr. Balo has finally gone crazy. Your brain is going to push back. And I won't be surprised, and I won't judge you for not believing me, but for once, maybe, but definitely, I am going to tell you the truth. Not hiding things. This is just the way the universe works. Up to this point, it's been smoke and mirrors and lies. Things like friction doesn't matter. Acceleration is constant. Okay. So why do I have a picture of Einstein up here? Why does this seemingly come out of left field. I mean, we just finished an entire unit dedicated to the wave-like nature of light. And I haven't forgotten, <coughs> excuse me, I'm on prednisone today as well as, uh, as, well as uh, antibiotics. We dedicated a whole three and a half weeks to wave optics, but I haven't forgotten the lecture on light. Right, we ended up with James Clark Maxwell. This is the next person that's going to weigh in on the argument that has to do with light. But before we get there, we need to address an elephant in the room, and it is called relativity. There's really no better place to insert this idea because uh, if we're going to rewrite your brain anyway and you're understanding the universe, we might as well just do it now. So here ends classical physics. The physics of baseballs and cars and, and things behaving nicely and all of that kind of stuff. And we are going to change our concept of how the universe is put together. This will end with black holes and warp drive. But it begins 
with the paper. <laughs> it's all good things too. Where did Albert Einstein come from and how did he come up with this crazy, crazy stuff? Um, Albert Einstein was a genius. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. Um, he, he could not let go of an idea. The idea he could not let go of was that the universe at its core is elegant, it's beautiful, and it's simple. Not, not easy to understand or easy to do mathematically, but simple in the sense that there should be very few basic laws around which the universe works. And any additional complexity means that we probably misunderstood what's going on, and we've got to get back to basics. And one of the problems that Albert Einstein set out to fix was a very simple one. Newton believed that light was a what? Particle, right? Maxwell came along and showed theoretically that light is a wave. Newton's particle physics dealt with the orbits of planets and baseballs and apples falling off of trees and universal gravitation and all of these things. And then there were Maxwell's equations, the equations of electric and magnetic fields um, that governed electricity and light and Albert Einstein took a long, hard look at both of those different ways of talking about the same universe and decided that that wasn't good enough. You can't have two set of traffic laws depending on which way you're going on Blackstone. Like, like, like if going north on Blackstone, green lights meant go, but going south on Blackstone, yellow lights meant stop. There would be chaos, right? You just, you just, and so to Albert Einstein, this was a, this was a, it was like an itch he couldn't, couldn't scratch. It was a problem that needed solving. There was something going on with our understanding of how the universe works. And Newton and Maxwell were not reconcilable. They, they, they were just very different from each other. They were trying, like Newton could explain light, but so could Maxwell. There was just... There weren't so many inconsistencies as there was an inelegance. It was sloppy, according to Albert Einstein. And so he set out to try to figure out what light was. It was his passion. It was his genius. It was the thing that kept him up at night. What is light? How does it work? What can I do with it? This is a picture of one of four papers that Albert Einstein published in 1905, the year that the universe, well, not the universe, but our understanding of it changed. Two years prior to the publication of these four papers, Sir William Thompson, Lord Kelvin, yes, that Kelvin, the temperature scale Kelvin, okay, gave a talk as an elderly gentleman to the rising generation of scientists, telling them that all significant science had been done and that all that was left was more refined measurement. In other words, Kelvin was telling everybody, we figured it all out. We've got this nailed down, it's in the box, all done. We just need to make better and better measurements and we can all go smoke our pipes at the pub. Okay? Albert Einstein would come along. Patent clerk, second class, okay? who's got time on his hands and mental bandwidth as he's going through patent applications for figuring out just how the universe is put together. Uh, most scientific papers, even in this time, get published and are um, full of like footnotes and bibliographies and references to prior work, 
right? They'll say, well, somebody did this and I'm extending that work or my theory is based off blah, blah, blah. The thing that's amazing about the, the paper uh, on relativity is that it contains nothing like that. It's a bolt from the blue. Like there's a couple of references to things that thought ideas, but really this comes out seemingly out of left field from an unknown physicist that can't even get a job teaching high school physics. Right? <clears throat> and it's one of four. It's sometimes referred to Einstein's miracle year. <laughs> four papers that would set the history of his life and the history of physics as we know it. One, two of those papers were on relativity. So this first one I'm showing you, there's just the first page of it. He, he wrote it in German. Um, is the very first laying out the concept. It would be followed by a second paper later in the year, August, uh, September time frame, where he would produce the mathematics of relativity. And that's where the famous E equals MC squared would show up for the first time. Only it, that's not correct, and I'm going to show you the corrected version next week. Um, the E equals MC squared is the one that gets put on all the chalkboards in the comic strips. It's, not, it's incomplete. Um, and then there were two more papers other than these two on relativity. One had to do with Brownian motion. Um, I don't want to get too deep into the woods here, but basically in that paper, Albert Einstein definitively proved the existence of atoms. Up till then, there wasn't definitive explanations for the existence of atoms. Albert Einstein was able to do with his explanation of Brownian motion. The other paper he gave was on the photoelectric effect, which we are going to talk about after relativity. So we'll get there. What did Albert Einstein do that was so amazing, so genius, that changed our concept of how the universe works and is put together? Well, as is Albert Einstein's way, he started very simply. Very basic. Okay? He wanted, again, his goal was to reconcile Newton and Maxwell, right? That, like, he, wants, he wants to understand how the universe works in a frame way, framework that doesn't have sort of competing ideas, but one overall framework. And so he starts um, with these things called postulates. These are rules, rules that will govern the thought process, the theorizing, the mathematics, everything that has to do with laying out um, a way to fix the inconsistencies between Newton and Maxwell. And you'll notice there are only two rules, just two, okay? The reason it's called special relativity is because we are, except for the very last day that we do relativity, we are not going to be talking about acceleration at all. Acceleration is part of general relativity. We will get there but we will spend most of our time in special relativity where acceleration doesn't happen, okay? So, two, two statements, which doesn't seem all that hard, right? And the first statement is Einstein basically saying that, look, I'm not reinventing physics. I'm saying, right? that everybody agrees on the laws of physics. In other words, the underlying mechanisms for how the universe works will be the same for everyone as long as they are in inertial reference frames. That's fancy words for no acceleration, okay? In other words, if I'm standing here and I drop an object, right, I can figure out how long it takes for that object to fall based on how high it is above the ground, all kinds of stuff. And you can go home and do the exact same experiment and get the same result. The laws of physics will be consistent between observers as long as their reference frames are consistent. Um, 
This is where the no acceleration part comes in because somebody who is doing this experiment in an accelerating car wouldn't see the keys fall straight down. They'd see them kind of arc because their frame of reference is speeding up while the keys are trying to fall straight down and you end up with kind of a different result for the experiment. But an inertial frame of reference okay, means that there's no acceleration going on. As long as there's no acceleration, whether you're in a moving car moving at constant speed or standing still, and you do experiments like this, any physics experiment, all the laws of physics will be consistent. There will be agreement on what is going on. So that's the first rule, and it seems it's not even so much a rule as it's just a sort of a definition, right? This is how physics works. It's the second one that really blows the socks off of everything. And you may not appreciate it yet, but by the time you walk out of the door today, I hope to have convinced you that the speed of light really is the same for everyone, regardless of how fast you are going. Let's begin simply. I need three volunteers. You don't need to get up. You, you can stay right in your seat. I just need three volunteers who's willing to uh, be an example of relativity for me. Okay, so we got Alette. Who else? Can I spell your name, Brad right, Alette? Is it two L's? One L? Did I get it right? Okay. Who else? Uh, we'll do Christian. And I saw Mary. Thank you, everybody. Put your hands up. Okay. Um, let's see. Um, and all. You drive a car? Okay, you like your car? Yeah, yeah get you places. <laughs> right? Yeah, okay. It's fast. Yeah, yeah, okay. Not well to say. Okay, right? No self incriminating statements whatsoever. Okay, so let's say, let's say. Manuel's in his car. Okay, right? Driving along. And let's say that Christian, this is, this is Manuel, um, Christian is standing by the side of the road, okay, um, with a radar gun in his hand, okay? So he can measure speeds and things, right? And I want to make it very clear. Alette would never do this. She is smarter than this, okay? But let's just, for the sake of argument and the thought experiment that I'm trying to set up here, do not do, don't do this. Okay, all right? Let's say Alette is sitting on the hood, okay, <laughs> of Manuel's car, and she is holding a baseball, okay? Uh, let's say Manuel's going, uh, we'll do this in miles per hour, I don't care, right? How fast is Manuel going? <laughs> <laughs> Dang. <laughs> 120? Okay, fine. Just, just, Manuel would never speed like this. I want everybody, right? Okay, good, right? Right? So, so Christian measures, okay? that Manuel is driving at 120 miles an hour, okay? With his radar gun, right? Radar gun says 120 miles an hour. Um, we all know that Alette is capable of throwing a fastball at 110 miles an hour. Yes, right? I mean, the major leagues don't know about her. If they did, they let women play baseball or something. There's no crying in baseball. There's no crying. You guys ever see that movie? Yes. Yeah. All right. So that 110 miles per hour is according to Alette. So maybe Alette has a, Manuel's got a speed gun, right? He's not using it to track his own speed. He's using it to track Alette's fastball. Okay. What would Christian measure? the speed of this baseball to be. 
It's 110 with regard to Aled and Manuel, but Christian says they're already moving at 120. So what would Christian measure? Two hundred and thirty miles an hour. Don't see it. If Alette says that she throws a ball at one hundred and ten with respect to her, and she's already moving one hundred and twenty miles an hour, according to Christian, what will Christian say this ball is moving at? Two hundred and thirty miles an hour. This is relativity. This is relative velocity. And it's a problem that Galileo outlined originally. So this is why we call it Galilean relativity. In other words, an observer, right, who sees something happen that is moving relative to themselves, will understand how to correct for things. Like, there is a fundamental disagreement in measurement here, isn't there? Manuel, holding his radar gun, says that 110, right, miles per hour is what this ball was thrown at. Christian says no. The ball is moving at 230 miles an hour. But we understand why there is a difference in these measurements. Why is there a difference between the measurement that Manuel makes versus the one that Christian makes? Because the car is moving, right? Because there is relative velocity. If the car were not moving, what would Manuel and Christian measure? Same thing, right? Whatever speed Alette throws the ball is what they both measure. But it's because there is motion that these two measurements disagree. However, everybody involved understands why there is a disagreement in measurement and can correct for it based on the relative motion between the two different frames of reference. So, that is the classical experiment. It can be done, we've done it a lot, okay? Mythbusters famously did an experiment where they drove a car forward but launched a bowling ball or something backwards at exactly the same speed, and it just dropped straight down, right? Because its relative velocity with respect to the ground would have been zero in that case, right? So anyway, it's been, it's been, you don't need the Mythbusters to prove it. We've done it very, very well, okay? All right, let's change this up just a little bit. Um, Manuel's going to hit the gas. I mean, he was going fast before, but he is now going to be going really fast. 99% the speed of light fast. Okay. Alette has traded her baseball for a flashlight. Okay, thank you. <laughs> what speed does the flashlight's beam of light travel at? The speed of light, right? So Alette says that this light comes out moving at the speed of light. Christian, down here, now has a light detector to be able to measure the speed of light, okay? And his own flashlight. More like a trumpet now, but okay, right? And Christian sees his flashlight and says that the, the light beam is moving at what speed? Speed of light. But Christian looks and says, ah, what is the speed of a let's light? Okay. If this were Galilean relativity, what would the answer be? 
Push Einstein away for just a second. 1.99, right? But you know, Einstein didn't know, but you know that the speed of light can never be bigger than the speed of light. Like, like it's the ultimate speed limit in the universe. I'm going to explain why next. Okay? We'll get there. We'll get there. Okay? But it is the only, you can't, nothing can go faster than light. Okay? Christian, under Galilean relativity, would say, oh, well, that should be 1.99. Just add them together just like we did before. The second postulate of relativity says, uh-uh. Alette and Manuel see the beam of light moving how fast? Speed of light. How fast does Christian see this beam going? Speed of light. Alette and Manuel looking at Christian's light beam see what? Speed of light. Oh, this is simple, Mr. Balo. I got this. Einstein just made it easy, right? If it's a beam of light, then... It's just all speed of light. We can go home. Why did he win the Nobel Prize for this? He didn't. We'll talk about how he won his Nobel Prize and what he awarded it later. This was not what he won the Nobel. This is what he's most famously known for. But this isn't the first time the Nobel Committee messed up. Okay. So, what gives? Like, what's the big deal here, Mr. Bela? How? Can two people moving relative to each other measure the same speed of a third moving object? Let that one sink in for just a second. The speed of Manuel's car makes no difference in the measurement of the speed of this light beam and this light beam. If that's true, what else pays the price? In other words, why isn't it 1.99? Why isn't it? And this is what Matt, uh, Einstein did a lot of. He sat thinking about it. He was like, if I'm on a train, on a motorcycle, like he did some weird stuff. He's riding a train. On a, he's riding a motorcycle on a train, and he turns the headlight on. Like, what would it look like, right? Would he see the beam of light coming out of the headlight, like, really slow? Like, if the train were going close to the speed of light, would he see that light just sort of barely inching forward, right? And he came to the conclusion that no, 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 no. Light is light, and it's the one thing that all observers are going to agree on. Speed of light is the same for everybody, no matter Who's doing the moving? As long as you're not accelerating. So how do we fix it? Well, to Einstein and to Manuel and Alette and Christian, the answer is you do an experiment. Right? You test. You test, you test, you test. And so here is the simplest experiment that can be done to verify measurements in a situation like this. Christian makes a light clock. So this, is a clock. this isn't a real thing. This is a theoretical construct. These, are very, these would be difficult to make in, from an engineering point of view. But from a laws of the universe physics point of view, this is the simplest thing that we could make to measure the passage of time. It would be two mirrors between which a beam of light is bouncing up and down. We're using light because under the postulates of special relativity, these are, this is the thing we agree on, right? It, no matter what else is going on, the speed of light is the speed of light for everybody. We can always agree on that number. No matter where it is, how fast it's going, all that kind of stuff. So, a tick and a talk, right? Tick tock of a clock, right? A way of measuring that a time interval has taken place would be as the beam of light leaves the bottom mirror comes up, bounces, there's your tick, and then comes back down and hits the bottom again, talk. And then you can just let it keep going around, right? Tick tock, tick tock, tick tock. We can measure a time interval here. It's going, what is that time interval going to be? Well, 
if we use D as the distance between the plates of the mirror, and we know the speed at which light travels, we know that distance is equal to velocity times time, right? Wait a second, Mr. Bale. What? That's, that's regular physics. I thought this was relativity. Ah, first postulate. What's it say? The laws of physics are the same. We're not, we're not throwing away kinematics. Okay? This relationship holds true. Right? We're not accelerating, so this relationship holds true. So the time interval is going to be the distance divided by the speed. Well, how far does the light beam travel for a complete tick-tock? 2D. And how fast is it going? Speed of light. See? Okay. So there we go. We have a time measurement based on distance travel, right? And the speed that the thing stand is classical physics, this is nothing new. Okay. So here's Christian with his light clock. And he gives a light clock to a let and Manlo on their clock, okay? So as long as everybody's standing still, nobody's moving, right? They're gonna agree that TikTok is the same, right? But let's take a look at what Christian would see as he watches Manuel drive past with a let holding that light clock in her hand. When the bean starts, the bottom of the clock is right here. But when the tick happens, according to Christian, where is the clock? It's moved sideways, hasn't it? This clock is in relative motion, right? So it's like it started here, but the top of the clock is now here. And so the beam of light, instead of going straight up and down, is going to do what? It's going to do a path like this. Remember, this clock is in motion, right? So it's going tick tock, tick tock. But now, right? If if I if I go straight up with my hand while moving sideways, you guys see this path, right? And again, am I breaking any of the laws of physics here? No, this is straight up. So there's the tick. And then when the talk happens, the clock is over here, isn't it? Okay. So we can form some triangles. It's a right triangle right there. Okay. And we know, okay, we know that the clock is moving with speed V. That's the relative speed. Right? 0 0.99 times the speed of light or whatever. Okay? And so we form this triangle trying to figure out okay, what the distances are in the relationships between these distances. So, um, for example, what's this distance right here? <laughs> They're identical clocks. Okay? So the vertical height here is D, isn't it? Okay. How far is the distance of the bottom leg of this triangle? Well, distance is equal to velocity times time, isn't it? So the bottom leg is going to be V times T. T over 2. Maybe we'll be a little bit consistent here. We'll be careful, right? Because the whole, we use the whole time t here as a tick tock, right? So for half of this triangle, it'll be half the time. So it's the speed times the time. Okay, that's the distance it travels. What's the length of this side? How fast is this beam of light traveling? It's traveling at the speed of light, isn't it? C delta, uh, CT over 2. It's a right triangle, isn't it? So can we do Pythagorean theorem on it? We can do a lot of stuff on it, right? But I've laid out, okay, that there's going to be a difference 
between the time that Christian measures and the time that Alette and Manuel measure. Christian is going to measure TikTok with his clock. But what is true about the beam of light in Manuel and Alette's clock? Does the beam of light travel the same distance? No. This beam of light does not travel 2D. It travels 2 times CTO2, right? The same speed for a longer distance. What does Christian see? If his tick, this is where your brain's gonna start fucking. If this tick tock is one second, what must this tick tock be? What do they agree on? The speed of light. What do they disagree on? How long it takes the clock to tick tock. No, your universe didn't shift? Okay, let's try this again. Is Christian's clock doing TikTok? Yes, by definition, just TikTok, 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 right? It's just sitting there, right? Christian sees the same speed of light, but that light has to travel a longer distance. If something going the same speed takes a longer, goes over a longer distance, what happens to the time for the journey? It increases. In other words, the time difference between tick and talk is bigger. Time runs slow. Christian sees time ticking slower for Manuel and Alette. Alette and Manuel do the same experiment in reverse, but from their point of view, who's moving? Christian's moving. They're standing still, and Christian's going by them in the opposite direction. And what do they see for Christian's clock? They see Christian's clock, the one in motion, moving slow. This is the essence of relativity. And let me explain, let me try to help your brain <laughs> through this exceedingly momentous result, which I can tell from a lot of your eyes and yawns, you're still not understanding, okay? <laughs> the import of this. There is something, when you woke up this morning, there was something that you assumed that wasn't true. A lot of things in your life you could probably put out. <laughs> Let's be very specific. There was something about time that you took for granted. That what? It moves linearly. linearly. <laughs> that the alarm went off <laughs> and that it went off at 6.30? 6 a.m., okay. 4.45 for me, okay. I actually beat my alarm awake. I was up at 3 this morning. Um, so the alarm goes off at 6 a.m., and the assumption was that that was 6 a.m. for everybody. And that when you measure a second and you measure a second and you measure a second, we all measure the same second. I hate to break it to you, but you're adults, so you can know this information now, okay? Time is not what you think it is. Then, we're not going there, okay? Because there's no way to test that. This is science, we test things, okay? Time is 
not the same for everybody. And you're like, well, of course, Mr. Baylow, I always knew that, right? My boss pays me not enough for the time that I spend at work, right? Like, like, and, and you've obviously like sat in lecture and time has gone by so slowly. No, because time is never going to end. Shoot me now. And then there's been other times like, wow, time flew. I am not referring to the psychology of the meat sacks that are you. Okay? I am talking about fundamental laws of the universe stating time changes with relative motion. And in fact, the faster something goes, the slower time is. Okay. Does it make sense? Oh, okay. Then you're lost. Okay? Because, because, notice, what I said, okay, I have not used any words like appears as or seems. What language am I using to describe this phenomenon? I'm done. <laughs> I'm using words like is. And I'm also doing the psychological trick of every time I tell you something, I drop my chin. Because what kind of body language is this? I'm telling you something now. I've been manipulating you for two semesters. It's time you find out. We do that already. You know that I was manipulating you, or you know this yeah. trick? Oh, I think you were manipulating you. Oh, yeah. Well, I, yeah. But I, I, I admitted to that long ago. Okay? When somebody is talking about factual information, you can always tell because their head is doing this. I'm, uh, I'm over-exaggerating it, but the next time you watch somebody on the news, a news anchor that's telling you information, their head is going to be doing this. They're not using their thumb, the finger, right? Okay? But they're, they're, the head movement is one of this, okay? When you're talking about the fun you had last night or the problems in your life or anything like that, okay? Where you're like communicating like either emotion or maybe not so factual information, Okay? The head starts to bounce around like that. Okay? And so students have often thought that I am like mystic or have supernatural powers or something because when we cross the room, I can say, hey, you guys, get back on the question. There's no possible way I could have heard them over the, the whole classroom. How did I know that they weren't doing physics? They were happy. Okay? <laughs> if they were talking about homework or something, you just watch, just watch it in graphs. Like people will be doing homework like this, and then they'll start talking about it in upper. Right? It just it happens. Anyway, that was a trend. That was wow. How did I get there? The point I'm trying to make here is that I am not equivocating. I'm not saying Einstein had this cool idea, let's explore it. No, 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 no. I am telling you right now that time runs slower for things that move. You have to move fast to see it. But that doesn't change the fact that it happens. That is the truth. Everything I taught you about how time is a constant in kinematics was a lie. It's a good lie at the time, but it was a lie. Okay. Animations help? Cartoons help, maybe? Let's see if we can't contextualize this in an animation. Yeah, Why is it the same when they say, like, high mom We're going to get to gravity later. That's general relativity. Remember, no accelerations. Gravity causes things to accelerate. We're, we're going. We're going. Where no one has gone before. Except the writers of Star Trek. The essence of his reasoning can be seen with the aid of the simplest possible clock. That's Albert. Two mirrors, a fixed distance apart with a light beam bouncing back and forth between them. Uh, that's Each bounce of the beam Sorry. 
is a tick or a tock of the timepiece. To Henry, his clock is stationary and altogether ordinary. But for Albert, that clock is moving. And between tick and tock, he sees the light beam trace a diagonal path, which means it's traveling a longer distance. But the speed of light is the same for all observers. So the light must take a longer time to travel the longer distance. Therefore, Albert believes the moving clock runs slow. Okay. I didn't set it up right. Henry Lorentz was a German mathematician who actually developed the mathematical framework for relativity about six years before Einstein needed it. But like all math, he didn't really know what it was because he was a mathematician. He didn't understand that it was real. Um, Einstein was able to look at it and go, oh my gosh, this is what I need to be able to explain what's going on here. Okay? Hen Heinrich Lorentz. Yeah, Heinrich. We want to get our full German on. Okay. Now, in that video, you saw how the talks were took longer between them, right? Okay, because of the movie clock. And it said at the very end that Albert believes... Ooh, so this video is using like cagey, cagey words, right? Like, oh, maybe this isn't true. The relativity of time is derived from the right triangle formed by the distances traveled. The Pythagorean theorem shows that the path of the moving light is longer than the distance between mirrors. I gotta get me one of these. Do my math for me. By the factor one over the square root of one minus v squared over c squared. This factor occurs so often in relativity that it is given its own symbol, the Greek letter gamma. What just happened? That triangle right there just happened. Okay? Einstein derived exactly how much the time would stretch out. In other words, Einstein had come up with time dilation. You've actually done this math. You did the exact math on the board. Not exactly the same steps they did, but you've done it. Problem number four on lab number one of this semester. I gave you a 2D over C with a delta T, and I gave you another equation. That was the Pythagorean that had like a square root and stuff in it, okay? You actually did that derivation without knowing it, okay? So that means I don't have to do it, and the video did it for you. It doesn't matter how you derive it. What matters are the implications, the results of what's going on here. Let's review. Albert Einstein is saying that the speed of light is the same for all observers, no matter who's doing the moving. Simple statement. The implications of the statement, though, is that time is not what you think it is. Time is relative, time changes. Time is not the standard that you think it is. A second is not a second, it depends. Spoiler alert, you also have to change space <laughs> to account, we'll get to that and force and acceleration and everything else. You throw it all out the window and come up with new appreciation for what time is, what measurement is, all of this. But it's a price worth paying because it turns out to be the way that the universe works. <laughs> and I will spend the rest of now trying to prove it to you. Let's talk about gamma. Gamma is this, um, it's a magic number. 
Okay? And when you are lost in relativity, you can always calculate gamma. They'll give you a speed, okay? Find gamma. It's 1 over the square root of 1 minus the speed squared divided by uh, speed of light squared. But let's, let's dig into what, ha what is happening here. This is a plot of that function. It's the gamma function, putting in different speeds. So let's put in 0, okay? So, so gamma is the 1 over the square root of 1 minus v squared. I know they're using u up there. Don't worry about that to speak, okay? So what happens if we put in 0? Put in 0 for v. What's 1 minus 0? What's square root of 1? What's 1 over 1? Okay, so the smallest gamma can ever be is 1. Okay, what happens if we put c squared in there? What's c squared over c? Uh, put c in there. What happened? What's c squared over c squared? 1. What's 1 minus 1? 0. What's the square root of 0? 0. What's 1 divided by 0? Be careful. It's not undefined. I told you, be careful. <laughs> I know, it's because what the mathematicians taught you. It's all wrong. What's one divided? What's one divided, but what's any number divided by the smallest number ever? Infinitely big. What's one divided by one? What's one divided by two? What's 1 divided by 4? What's 1 divided by 100? What happens the bigger the denominator gets? The number gets small. Okay. What's 1 divided by 1? Good. What's 1 divided by 0.1? Pandemic was good. That's 10, right? Okay. What's 1 over 100? Okay. What's 1 over a million? What's happening the smaller you make a denominator? The number gets bigger. So now, what's 1 over a number that is so small it might as well be 0? Infinity. In math speak, it's the limit. <laughs> you divide anything by a tiny thing, and you get a big thing. What does gamma become when you approach the speed of light? It becomes infinitely large. The gamma factor tells us, and notice, notice where most of the change is happening. Well past three quarters of the speed of light, right? 75% of the speed of light, 0.75 C. That's where a, you can't even really notice that anything is going on until you get to half the speed of light. And even then, the amount of change in time is small. Most of the interesting stuff happens when you're 90, 99%, 97%, the speed of light, like way up there, okay? So let me, well, I'll just do it on this screen. Why not? We know gamma. Nine, ten, okay. <laughs> why did it, why did it wait? <laughs> yes. Yeah, I need something else. I'm already on Lexapro, so. <laughs> Yay, Lexapro. <laughs> <laughs> no, so it keeps me nice. <laughs> no, the prednisone is just giving me heat flashes and making it so my, my voice doesn't disappear. I can feel your face right now. 
What's that? Can you feel your face? Oh, yeah. Why? Did you want to slap me or something? No. <laughs> okay. Cut. That. I got that. I got this. Technological house of cards is put back together again. Yes? Oh. A time interval. The, the delta between tick and talk is going to be gamma times the proper time interval. So I've got a delta t, which is my dilated time, and I've got a proper time interval, which we'll get to what the proper time is in a second. Okay? But this right here is the equation for time dilation. The reason we call it time dilation is because the time between tick and talk is getting bigger. It dilates. It gets wider. Um, remember, gamma is a number between 1 and infinity. And so our dilated time is going to be this gamma factor times this proper time, the time as if the clock weren't moving. But that's not the definition of proper time. I'll give you that in a second. Okay. So as a clock is observed to be moving faster and faster at the speed of light, the slower that clock will tick and talk. Next thing your brain's going to have to deal with. This is true for everything that depends on time. What depends on time? Everything. This isn't just clocks. It's heartbeats. It's plant growth. It's cellular division. Every process in the universe slows down when it, when it moves past you. It's simply a question of how much does it slow down. Are you younger than you should be if you take a plane flight? Yes. You moved relative to the ground. Time moved slower for you. We've measured this. <laughs> Astronauts, after six months on the International Space Station, come back approximately two to three microseconds younger than they would have been if they had stayed on the surface of planet Earth. Two or three microseconds. That's the difference between two gray hairs and three. No. It's hard to measure because you have to go fast. I will give you experimental evidence for this next week, okay? I promise I'm not lying. I will show you exactly what's going on here. But we have to wait a little bit. We've got to slog through what it means to measure time, time dilation, all of this good kind of stuff. So let's start with talking about proper time. Um, Proper time has a definition that, again, you are going to reject, and your brain is going to say, no, I don't want to do that, and then you're going to try to come up with lies to make it better, and all the lies are going to fail you, okay? So I'm going to say it once, I'm going to say it several times, we're going to repeat it over and over again. Proper time is the time that is measured between two events that happen at the same location. Huh? Proper time is the time interval measured between two events that happen at the same location. What is time? Not, not proper time, just time in general. How do you know a second has gone by? Apparently, many of you have never thought about this before. <laughs> but consistent counting. consistent counting, one Mississippi, 
One alligator. How do you know a second has gone by? Break down for me the process you would use to measure one second. <laughs> you would okay, well you're okay, man, okay, I'm not. You would push a button on a stopwatch or a clock or something, right? Okay? And then when that thing says one second, you push stop. Your measurement of time depended on two events, things happening. What was the first event? Start, okay? What was the second event? Stop, or I've seen one on the screen, or whatever. Blinking your eyes, Mississippi's. Whatever the events are, there is one that specifies the beginning of a time measurement, and there's another one that specifies the end of a time measurement. How do we know when an hour has passed? Because that, because the sun was there and then it was, right? Like, like there are events. Now, the proper time is defined as the time interval measured between events. And now notice, notice what the definition hangs on. Same place. To measure proper time, you have to be seeing the tick and the tock happen at the same place. Christian sees his clock ticking and talking at the same place. Does he see a let's clock ticking and talking at the same place? No. What is Christian measuring for a let's clock? Not proper time, because proper time would be measured when the tick and the clock happen at the same place. This is a measurement of dilated time. Everything hinges on your ability to recognize whether a time interval being given is proper or not. Let me tell you how your brain is going to try and save you from drowning. It's going to try to do shortcuts like, oh, well, if it's moving, it's dilated. That is not necessarily true. That's actually worse than 50-50 because I've seen students convince themselves out of the correct answer over and over and over again. Okay, you, were, you would be better off literally randomly guessing. Okay, so your safety, your life raft in the sea of relativity, look for events that happen at the same place. Make sure you're understanding what events are being used to measure time, and then see what you can't put together. Here's an example. And, and after this example, you'll be able to do all the time dilation equations. Just <clears throat> yes, my laptop real quick. All right. Rocket ships. Rocket ships are fun. There are going to be a lot of rockets, clean ons, and things like that in, in, in our examples here, right? Okay. But you're on a rocket, okay? And you're given a speed. This will be the relative speed between observers. But you first have to conceptualize. Who's in the problem? Who's doing the measurement? So that you can then be enabled to figure out proper times, dilated times, all that kind of stuff. So, so who are the actors? Who's involved in this problem? You. And who else? Your sister. If you don't have a sister, pretend you have one. OK. So, um, no, that, that's not that's not Earth. You could tell because it was it was not. Okay. There's Earth. There's your sister. Okay. And here's the rocket. 
My rockets always look like carrots. I'm sorry, just the way it is. And there's there's you. Okay. Now, who is moving? Ah, they both are. This is relativity now, right? One of the things you have to realize about relativity is that there is no absolute frame of reference. Let me continue to destroy your understanding of the physical universe. When you woke up this morning, not only did you believe the lie that time is the same for everybody, but you also believed the lie that the ground wasn't moving. Is the ground moving? Yes. Okay. But you assumed that the ground doesn't move. And when you got in your car and drove at 40 miles an hour to get here, you made an assumption. 40 miles an hour compared to what? Everything else. 40 miles an hour with respect to the non-moving but really moving ground. In physics, the mathematics of kinematics does not care if the ground is stationary and you're doing the one moving, or if you are stationary and the ground is moving. It is equally valid to say that you got out of your house, you got in your car, and the school came to you at 40 miles an hour. Thank you. I'm not laughing completely out loud. Okay. <laughs> You're like, that's nuts, Mr. Bailey. I'm like, is it? In physics, we have no way to prove which one is the correct answer. Okay, well, then that's why physics is dumb. No, 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 no. This is driving at something very, very critical and interesting. Relativity does not, there is no master observer. There is no one person that has got all the answers and is doing all the observing or knows what's going on. Everybody in every problem is smart. They are reporting what they see. There is a version of this problem where you, according to your sister, are moving at 0.99, the speed of light, away. And there is another version of this problem where you are standing still, okay, and your sister is going the opposite direction at 0.99, the speed of light. Or maybe you're going 0.18 and they're going in the opposite direction of whatever that number would be to make it all work out. The point is, there is no one frame of reference that is the master frame. You woke up this morning assuming there was a master frame of reference where the ground doesn't move, where time is the same, and all my lengths are consistent. And that is simply not how the universe works. It's how our society functions. If you try to use these uh, explanations when the officer politely pulls you over and wonders why you were speeding, and you say something like, well, officer, the ground was speeding, it wasn't me. Don't make me your first phone call to get you out of jail. Okay? Right? It doesn't work. So, I, I like, I should probably just do this problem. I'll, I'll tell you that story later. So, what the heck is going on? How do I survive these things, right? So, you have to identify a time measurement of some case, of some type. There is a time interval that's being measured in this problem. What is the time interval? It's a year, right? It, it's, it's right there, okay? It's a one-year trip. And so, we have a one-year time interval. The question is, is this a dilated time? Or is this a proper time? Sometimes there's a P on the bottom. I didn't check to see what your, your book does for that. But regardless, okay? Of whether that's dilated or proper, there is something we can calculate right off the bat. And I suggest you calculate it right away because you're going to need it. And it's a small victory, and you need small victories in this stuff. 
So what's the one thing that we can always calculate? Gamma. 1 over the square root of 1 minus 0.99c quantity squared over c squared. Why are we always writing our velocities as a factor of the speed of light? Makes the uh, units really simple. <laughs> the c squareds cancel. And so in your calculator, what you're going to do is you're going to take the square root of 1 minus 0.99 squared and then invert it. Uh, when I did that, I got 7.08, or approximately 7, okay? So the gamma factor doesn't have units. It's just a factor. It's a multiple, okay? Okay, so this speed, gamma, has a value of about 7. And so now we're back to the existential crisis of which is which, dilated time or proper time. The one year was measured by who and according to what? You got to know who's doing the measuring. So who did the measuring? You, the person on the, on the rocket ship, right? Okay. And what were the events that marked the one year passing of time? Something started, something stopped. What was it? The ship's clock said go, zero, and then calendar pages flipped or whatever happened, right? You marked off the days, blah, blah, blah. Your clock said it was one year. Then that was the stopping point. So the events were the starting and stopping of a time piece on the spaceship, right? Proper or dilated time. And how do you tell the difference? What's the key to knowing whether it's proper or dilated? Events that mark the time interval happening where? At the same place. There is only one frame of reference where the starting and the stopping of this trip happens at the same place. Is it the picture on the left? or the picture on the right. Picture on the left. The Earth is not doing the measuring, right? So the Earth would be looking at the ship's clock and calendar. At the beginning of the year, the ship is there. Where is the ship according to Earth a year later? Somewhere else. Right? From the Earth's point of view, the Earth is standing still, rocket going. If it's the rocket's clocks and calendars, that means the tick of the, of the year, the very first measurement, right, was here, and then a year later was over there. Is that proper time? No. So it has to be the right-hand picture. Let's check the right-hand picture. For the person on the ship, what do they see? They see Earth go zoom. Right? Their clock and calendar is right here with them. And so they measure proper time. The measurement of the year on the ship is the proper time. And there's an example right there. Just because something is moving doesn't mean it's dilated. It depends on who's doing the measuring. It's really, really important. It's important that you don't clue in just on motion, but that you think it through. Who's doing the measuring? What are they measuring? What are the events? And do they happen at the same place? So in this problem, the proper time is one year. The math here is stupid simple. How do we find the measurement for Earth? we solve for the dilated time. Gamma times the proper time, seven times one year equals seven years. According to people on the ship, only one year went by. According to people on planet Earth, seven years went by. The one year, okay, on the spaceship was seven years on Earth. 
So when you arrive at your destination and your sister was 17 when you left and you were, what was it, 22? How old are you now? 23. And how old's your sister? 24. This is real. We do not have the engineering to do this with humans. Like we can't go 99% the speed of light and I will tell you why next week. But trust me this time, everything I have taught you today is real, factual. We've actually measured this happening. And we'll do more of it on Monday in the lab. Bring a pair of very fast tennis shoes. No, you don't have to bring tennis shoes, but lab will be a surprise. Not a good one. <laughs>